Romans chapter 5. Going to begin reading in verse 12 this morning, and we're going to talk about grace is greater. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 12. Paul says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people, because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged to anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as Adam did, who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that trespasses might increase, but where sin increased, grace super increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to come help us this morning. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for the people you love so much. Thank you for your presence here. I pray we would encounter you through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees, would you say amen and amen. Beloved, I want to tell you this morning that God's cure for sin is greater than the curse of sin. That's the truth that I want you to take away in your heart this morning. God's medicine is more powerful than our sin. God's prescription is more powerful than our predicament. God's remedy is more powerful than our malady. God's provision is more powerful than our problem. Last week, Pastor Nick introduced us to Paul's how much more statements in Romans 5. You recognize statements like this. Jesus used these kind of statements all the time. Jesus said if God feeds the sparrows and he clothes the lilies of the field, how much more will he take care of you who are far more valuable than, to him than a sparrow? In Romans 5 verse 10, Pastor Nick showed us this how much more. If God reconciled us while we were enemies, how much more will he surely save us now that we're his sons and daughters? If God loved us and helped us while we were estranged from him, how much more will he help us now that we belong to him? And if Jesus death meant reconciliation to God, how much more will his resurrection life keep us safe and sound in God? If the dying Savior rescued us, how much more will the ever-living Savior completely restore us? Oh, I like these how much mores. They're good. In the back half of Romans 5, there are some more how much mores and they're great ones. They bring us the message that God's salvation is more powerful than our sin. You know, among students of the Bible, these verses are famous for what they teach about sin. So famous, in fact, that it's possible to overlook the greater thing that they say about our salvation. These verses are famous for the doctrine of original sin. 
That is the biblical truth that we are all born sinners. Every one of us, with the exception of Jesus. David wrote about it when he said, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. In Romans chapter 5, Paul explains how that happened. When Adam sinned, the entire human race was still locked up inside of his body. Adam was carrying us all with him. And when he sinned, Paul says, we sinned. His sin became our sin. When Adam disobeyed God, we all disobeyed God. As the head of the human race, Adam plunged us all into sin. We are all born sinners. We are all born guilty of sin before we even draw our first breath. In fact, David says from the time of conception. We are all born with a sin nature. We are all born with a bent, a tendency towards sin. We all do what our father Adam did. Even though our conscience tells us that something is wrong, we're inclined to do that anyway. The only exception, of course, is Jesus. Although Jesus was fully a man, Jesus' father was God. Jesus wasn't in Adam's loins when Adam sinned. Original sin is important for us to understand for sure. But Paul says something far better here about our salvation. If sin is really bad, and it is, how much greater is God's salvation? Paul tells us here that salvation hasn't just restored us to Adam's original state, but salvation has lifted us into an even better state. In other words, God's salvation medicine didn't just make us as good as new. It made us better than Adam ever was. Some of you might remember the incomparable Henny Youngman. He used to tell an old joke. A patient asked, Doc, will I be able to play the piano after my surgery? The doctor said, why, yes, of course. The patient said, good, because I couldn't play before. The message of Romans 5 is that God's salvation is so powerful that we can play the piano now even though we couldn't play before. Looking at Paul's words in Romans 5, I see three ways that grace is greater. And I want to share them with you quickly today. Three ways that grace is greater. First this, if human innocence was good, how much more is the gift of God's righteousness. If human innocence was good, how much more God's righteousness? Adam was not created perfect like God. He was created innocent. And as the world found out, there's a big difference. Adam was not righteous like God. He was merely sinless. And when put to the test, human innocence did not stand up. Hannah proclaimed in her song of praise, There is none righteous like our God. There is no one beside you. And Hannah was right. Only God is holy. Adam plunged the whole human race into the darkness of sin. But God sent his son Jesus to rescue us through his death on the cross. Adam committed one act of disobedience and doomed us, but Jesus committed one act of ultimate obedience, the cross, and he redeemed us. And here's the thing that Paul says about Jesus' salvation. Jesus does something far better than to restore us to Adam's state of innocence. Instead, Jesus gives to us the gift of God's own righteousness. So now we are not merely sinless. Now we have God's power within us that Adam never had not to sin. Doc, will I be able to play the piano after my surgery? Why, yes, of course. Good, because I couldn't play before. Adam was created innocent. 
but he lacked the virtue and the power within himself to stay that way. We are born in Adam guilty of sin, but through faith in Jesus, we're not only washed clean again, but we receive as a gift God's virtue and power to stay clean. Beloved, do you see it this morning? God's cure for sin is greater than the curse of sin. God's salvation medicine doesn't just make us as good as new. It makes us better than we ever were or ever could have been. You know, I feel like there's a word for someone in this place today. If you've opened a door to sin in your life and it's caused you loss, if you've opened the door to addiction or impurity and it's destroyed your relationships, your career, your finances, your health, if you're struggling with despair, the Holy Spirit wants you to know that Jesus can restore you not to where you once were, but he can make you better than you ever were or ever could have been. His grace is greater than all your sin. Three ways that grace is greater. If human innocence was good, how much more is the gift of God's righteousness? Second, if sin abounds, how much more does grace superabound? Romans 5 is significant for what it teaches about sin. It not only teaches us about the origin of sin, it also teaches us about the nature of sin. Paul says here that the nature of sin is to dominate us. He says here that sin reigns. Sin rules us as individuals. Sin rules human society. Sin enslaves us. Jesus said whoever sins is a slave to sin. Paul also says that the nature of sin is to destroy us. Sin causes death, both spiritual and physical. Sin separates us from God, and eventually it separates our spirit and our soul from our human bodies, and sin makes us sick in every way in the meantime. Paul also says here that the nature of sin is to proliferate. The nature of sin is to rapidly grow, to rapidly spread. Beloved, listen to me. Sin is uncontrollable and uncontainable. It's impossible to dabble in just a little bit of sin. Once the door to sin is open, just a crack, the floodgates are wide open. The Bible uses the metaphor of yeast. Once yeast is introduced to a lump of dough, it rapidly multiplies and it infects the whole thing and nothing can stop it. But what Paul says about salvation here is even more important than what he says about sin. The nature of sin is to dominate, but the nature of grace is to liberate. Paul says that sin once reigned over us, but now grace reigns over us instead. We are no longer oppressed by sin. We are now protected by grace. The nature of sin is to destroy, but the nature of grace is to restore. The nature of sin is to proliferate, to rapidly spread, but the nature of grace is to proliferate much more and to swallow up our sin. Paul says that Adam's one sin plunged the entire world into judgment and condemnation and death, but God's gift is not like the trespass. It can't even be compared. God's gift erases many sins. In fact, all our sins. Paul says where sin abounds, grace literally, he uses the word super abounds. In fact, you know, Jesus took that symbol of yeast and he redeemed it. He turned that symbol on its head. He used yeast as a symbol now for the way that God's righteousness grows inside of us instead. None of us will ever forget the BP oil spill that happened in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. For 90 days, a broken oil well spewed 130 million gallons of oil and natural gas into the Gulf of Mexico. It looked like the environment might be doomed for decades, but then scientists discovered something amazing. There is a bacteria in the Gulf of Mexico that eats oil, if you will. 
it, it breaks oil and natural gas down into compounds that are not harmful to the environment. When the Gulf oil spill happened, that bacteria bloomed. It rapidly proliferated and it gobbled up all the oil and the natural gas. You know, that's just what grace does. Where sin is spewing out nasty filth, grace blooms and it gobbles up all our sin. On Thursday, Pastor Tommy Barnett invited us back out to the Los Angeles Dream Center to preach at Angeles Temple. Some of you went with us a couple of years ago when we went. Some of you have visited since then. 20 years ago, the city of Los Angeles gave Pastor Tommy, the Queen of Angels Hospital, a massive, massive 15-story complex. Pastor Tommy and his son Matthew have converted it into a rehabilitation center for drug addicts and prostitutes. They help homeless people. They have about 150 or more struggling veterans living at the Dream Center. 900 people live there, and every one of them is a trophy of God's grace. We went on a tour on Thursday morning, and the stories just make you want to find a corner and weep for a while. Floor after floor, men's floor, women's floor, families, young men and women who were neglected by their parents, abandoned, sexually abused, physically abused. Met an 18-year-old girl who became a drug addict. She was abused by her parents, ran away from home, went in with a man who held her hostage and then trafficked her into prostitution. It seems like there is no bottom to the ugliness of sin. But then to see what grace has done in their lives. There is no limit for grace's ability to conquer sin. Beloved, listen to me. Grace has an even greater capacity than sin. Grace has more volume than sin. No matter how much sin can multiply, grace can multiply much more. Paul says there is no comparing. God's gift is much more powerful than Adam's offense. I'm preaching better than you're listening, by the way, this morning. I'm just telling you. So first service, listen better than you. Just saying. I'm going to go away again. <laughs> Paul says something interesting here in Romans 5. He says that Adam was a type of the one who was to come. That's Jesus. How is Adam who disobeyed a type of Jesus who came and perfectly obeyed? Well, Adam is like Jesus in the sense that they both did something that affected the whole human race. But the outcomes were very, very different. Adam's act of disobedience brought sin and death to the whole world. But Jesus' act of perfect obedience brought the possibility of salvation to the whole world. The fact that Adam was a type of the one to come tells us that the incarnation and the cross of Christ were not God's emergency plan B after Adam fell. Before the creation of the world, God foreknew that Adam would fall and God foreplanned to send Jesus to save us. That's why he is called the Lamb of God who was slain from the foundation of the world. Maybe we could think about the difference between Adam and Jesus this way. In the 1930s in Bavaria, Albert Einstein was working on the theory of relativity. Now, that has nothing to do with lending money with your relatives. <laughs> Einstein's discoveries led to the creation of the atomic bomb, a discovery that has affected all of mankind down to this very day. The fear of nuclear accidents, the threat of nuclear war still looms over our heads. What dominates our headlines to this very day? The possibility of rogue nations like Iran and North Korea becoming nuclear powers and what we should do about it. The threat of a dirty bomb perhaps being set off in one of our major cities, the cleanup of Fukushima in Japan. You know, the atomic bomb has been used twice in history, killing about 200,000 people, since then, there have been about 20 nuclear accidents estimated to have killed about 1 million people, Chernobyl being the worst in 1986.
But also in the 1930s, in Scotland, there was a man named Alexander Fleming who was researching cures for the flu. Quite by accident, he left one of his Petri dishes uncovered, and when he came back, he found that mold had grown in it. He was about to throw it away, but he decided to look under the microscope, and he discovered that the flu virus was not growing where the mold was. His discovery led to the creation of penicillin and then to a whole host of antibiotics after it. You know, in comparison to the mushroom cloud of a nuclear blast, the quiet healing work of penicillin happens completely unnoticed by most of us. But do you know that penicillin has saved an estimated 120 million lives? One man created a monster that has claimed 1.2 million lives in 80 years, but another man created a masterpiece that has saved as 100 times as many lives in 80 years. And that's just like Adam and Jesus. Adam and Jesus are alike in that they both did something that affected all of humanity. But while Adam created a monster that dramatically takes lives, Jesus has created a far more powerful masterpiece that quietly saves lives. <laughs> Beloved, do you see it? God's cure for sin is greater than the curse of sin. Don't give in to despair. It seems like sin is so pervasive and so powerful in the world. Indeed, we're living in a day when there is a dramatic increase of sin. Jesus said it was going to go down that way. But there is no shortage of the supply of grace to liberate you and me from sin. Grace is still more than powerful enough to give us the victory over sin. That's why Paul writes a few verses down in chapter 6. Sin shall not have dominion over you. Three ways that grace is greater. If human innocence was good, how much more is the gift of God's righteousness? If sin abounds, how much more does grace superabound? And finally this. Worship team, you can help me. If indefinite earthly existence was good... How much more is the gift of eternal life? Theologians are ambivalent about what would have happened to Adam if he had not sinned. Some believe that perhaps God would have eventually transported him to heaven like he did Enoch and Elijah. By the way, Enoch and Elijah are coming back again and it may be soon. Adam was created for indefinite earthly existence. But Paul says here that through Jesus, we have received something far better. We have received the gift of eternal life. Eternal life transforms our experience here on earth. Paul says that grace now reigns over us so that we can reign in this life. What does it mean to reign in life? I guess there's a lot we could say, but I like to think about it this way. To reign in life means that we have balance and it means that we have a grip. One of the most awful books in the Bible is the book of Judges. It is full of awful stories. One awful story is of a Canaanite king named Adonai Bezek. You can read about him in Judges chapter 1. His name means the God of lightning. The men of the tribe of Judah chased down Adonai Bezek. And when they finally caught him, they cut off his big toes and his thumbs. Everybody said, yuck. <laughs> you see, our big toes, they give us balance for walking. And our thumbs give us the ability to grip. Without our big toes, all we can do is hobble through this life. Without our thumbs, we can't hold on to anything. When you go for lunch today after service, I know you're already thinking about lunch. When you go for lunch, try holding on to your silverware without using your thumbs and see what happens. 
Now imagine a king who cannot walk or cannot run and a king who can't hold a sword in battle nor a spear to hunt nor a scepter on his throne. He's not much of a king at all. The best he can do is eat scraps. Adonai Bezek was named after the god of lightning, but he was anything but lightning fast and lightning furious after they cut off his big toes and his thumbs. He lamented in Judges chapter 1, listen, 70 kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off have picked up scraps from under my table and now God has repaid me for what I did to them. Sin has left us all in that same condition without our big toes and our thumbs. Sin has left us hobbling through life. Jesus called it stumbling in the darkness. Sin has left us unable to get a grip. It's left us defenseless. It's left us helpless. Kings with no power. Kings in disgrace. Living below the level of the stature which God created us for. Adonai Bezek lived the rest of his life and he died in Jerusalem without his thumbs and without his big toes, but not us. You see, grace has restored us. Grace has transformed us. Grace has brought us eternal life now. Grace gives us a power and authority to reign in this life. Kings with honor and dignity. Kings with balance and the ability to get a grip. Grace gives us the ability to run and not grow weary, to walk and not faint. Grace gives us the ability not just to cope, but to overcome. Grace gives us the ability not just to survive on scraps, but to thrive in life. Doc, will I be able to play the piano after my surgery? Why, yes, of course. Good, because I couldn't play before. Beloved, do you see it this morning? God's cure for sin is far more powerful than the curse of sin. His medicine is more powerful than our sin. His prescription is more powerful than our predicament. His remedy more powerful than our malady. His provision more powerful than our problem. If in death then an earthly existence was good, how much more is the gift of eternal life? Eternal life transforms our experience here on earth. And finally this, eternal life prepares us for something far better than this earthly existence. Adam's original state was indefinite earthly existence. But Jesus' salvation has secured for us something far greater than that. Jesus has given us the hope of glory. Eternal life means that at the end of this life on earth, we are going to experience a supernatural transformation. We are going to receive a makeover. God is going to transform our earthly bodies into something far better than Adam ever had. Our human bodies are perfectly suited for life here on planet earth, but they could never survive in heaven. It would be like taking a fish out of water and asking it to live on dry ground. It would be like taking a bird out of the air and asking it to live underwater. Our human bodies are suited for earth, but they are not suited for the atmosphere of heaven. So God is going to transform our human bodies into glorified bodies. And not only that, but God is going to transform our fallen human nature into perfected nature. Peter says we have a promise that we will become partakers of his divine nature and God will share with us a portion of his own glory. John wrote that it has never yet been seen in the universe what we are going to become. There is a moment coming when we are going to have a revelation of Jesus Christ that no other created being in the universe has ever yet seen. And when we see him, we shall become like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now that doesn't mean that we become God or that we become a part of God. 
It means that he will make us like himself in a way that no other created being will ever experience. The parallel passage to Romans 5 is 1 Corinthians 15. Paul writes there, As in Adam all died, so all those in Christ will be made alive. Then the saying will come true, Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your sting? Where, O oh grave, is your victory? Thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved, do you see it? God's cure for sin is greater than the curse of sin. Jesus' salvation doesn't just make us as good as new. It makes us better than Adam ever was or ever could have been. And I can't help feeling like there's a word in this for somebody. Maybe you've been struggling with regret. Maybe you've been wishing you could go back to better days. Maybe you've been wishing you could be innocent again. Maybe you're wishing that things could just be like they used to be. Here's the word of the Lord for you this morning. Receive it in your spirit and receive his life. God doesn't just want to make you as good as new again. He wants to make you better than you ever were. God has plans to make you better than you ever could have been. His grace is greater. His grace is greater. His grace is greater. Would you stand on your feet and give Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, a great big praise in this place today? Amen.